Hello. We won't keep you long. I know we've kept you waiting days on end for the vote that didn't happen but finally did. It was the Christmas miracle we were all hoping for, which was to send a positive signal to the people on the ground in Gaza who are suffering under such unbearable circumstances that the council is engaged 24-7 on trying to alleviate that suffering. And that is why we've all, in our different capacities, and I thank each and every person here who has contributed in this group, but in particular, the ambassador of Egypt, uh, Ambassador Sama, and in particular, Dr. Riyadh, the ambassador of Palestine, for the immense support behind the scenes into trying to adopt and achieve a resolution that has impact on the ground uh, for the people who need it the most. Last week, the UAE uh, took a number of Security Council members, both current and incoming, to the Rafah border crossing because often we sit in these rooms and we negotiate text endlessly without understanding sometimes the full implications of what is happening on ground. And I think that trip facilitated by the government of Egypt where we saw so much evidence of that suffering, so many thousands of trucks that were not able to go into Gaza, despite the fact that Gazans today are classified, half of the population is starving, and that famine is a very real possibility in Gaza as we go into our Christmas celebrations and holiday and festive season celebrations. So keeping people at the forefront of our work is when the council does its best diplomacy. And although the situation is still bleak uh, and dark, I hope this is a glimmer of hope uh, ahead that we can unite uh, both as an Islamic and Arab group, but also in the Security Council to try and deliver outcomes that are actionable, operational, and mean something to people on the ground. And I know other speakers have mentioned what this resolution does. I know you've read it several iterations of it. I'm often amazed how often I see it in the press before I've even distributed it to the council members, so well done you. Um, but I think this resolution really does have key uh, aspects that are going to be important, not just in the months, but also in the years ahead, with putting a firm UN presence on the ground in the form of a mechanism, with appointing a special coordinator to oversee those efforts, with calling on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, with scaling up humanitarian aid into Gaza uh, and expanding the access routes to that aid, uh, and in calling for the first time in a council document for a cessation of hostilities. This is important language, uh, and we will continue to build on that language. So uh, maybe my colleagues would like to say a few words, and perhaps you'd like to ask a question, yeah. First, you said in the council diplomacy isn't always what you uh, want, but what you can get. Do you feel like you got enough, and what's the next step if not? I think, uh, uh, again, putting people on the ground uh, first and foremost in mind, it would be really easy just to go for rhetorical declarations and end without consensus where we adopt something. And that doesn't help people on the ground. So I feel that what we have done will have impact, will save lives on the ground. And again, as I said in the council, I have to thank uh, the United States for their close collaboration, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield for her close collaboration in trying to achieve that outcome. We had the goal of saving lives on the ground in mind. Of course, it was not a perfect resolution. Of course, everyone in this group has called for a permanent ceasefire, and we support uh, what we put forward in the General Assembly that had 153 votes in favor for that ceasefire. And the UAE did submit that resolution less than 10 days ago, and it was, it was not adopted. So we can go for declarations in the council, or we can try and have impact on the ground for people who need it the most. Civilians in Gaza are dying because of the war. Uh, 20,000, 60% women and children, that is a fact. It's also a fact that several thousand more will die as predicted by UN agencies from lack of food, lack of water, lack of access to basic medical supplies. People are dying from infections. There is widespread spread disease. And so when we went to the Rafah border and we called for a code red moment as we listened to the UN officials on ground, I think that has led into the discussions here today which led to an outcome. But it's not perfect, it's diplomacy. Ambassador, you've spoken about widespread support for actions such like this outside the council. Can you talk us through not opening this resolution up to co-sponsors? Obviously, the first iteration had a lot of co-sponsors, which shows that there was a lot of widespread member support and they wanted to publicly continue that support. What was the discussion around not opening it up to co-sponsors, this Absolutely. particular resolution? Absolutely. So I'd like to say that this resolution, the genesis, was a mandate from the ministerial meeting in Riyadh. Uh, in Saudi Arabia 
uh, in November to try and bring a humanitarian resolution to the Security Council, and there was a lot of iterations of that work. Uh, and we opened it for co-sponsorship to the resolution we put in blue on Friday evening, which achieved 83 or 82 co-sponsors, I believe, which is very high for a council resolution on, of a humanitarian nature, and it shows the support. We did not open the resolution we put into blue for co-sponsorship simply because the negotiations were so last minute so complicated. Uh, there was a lot of different exchange of views. You saw us meet here in the council several times and in close consultation. As Ambassador Greenfield said, there was numerous phone calls, five in the morning, midnight. And the, this resolution went into blue this morning, I believe at 9 a.m. Uh, so to go through the co-sponsorship, and by the way, the SCAD e-delegate sponsorship system is complicated, and so to, go, to open it up didn't feel necessary. I think the resolution before was a clear signal. I think the General Assembly ceasefire resolution is a clear signal, uh, and I think today's adoption with 13 votes in favor is a clear signal, and now we will all follow up on implementation. This creates a reporting structure to the Security Council of what is going into Gaza and what is not going into Gaza. And there is accountability in that. Thank you. Um, I was wondering why you made a compromise in terms of OP2. You could have pushed the US to veto and you could uh, take advantage of it. Again, I think our uh, our objective and our obligation was primarily humanitarian to try and help save lives for the people on the ground. The amendment that was put to the vote today showed the majority view of the council, which was to have had the original language from the uh, resolution on Friday. The veto gets people nothing. The veto is simply a political declaration, but its, a, it's failure to adopt means that it doesn't have impact for lives on the ground. What we did today establishes a number of principles and a robust architecture to respond to the humanitarian crisis that I've just outlined. Uh, and I think, you know, bearing in mind that the suffering is an immense, that it will get worse if aid and medicine and food and water does not go in, I think we did the right thing. Of course, history uh, is full of uh, 2020 in hindsight moments. But I think we did the right thing, right thing today with the tools that we had and with the global dynamics that we have in this international community. We used it to the best of our ability to help save lives. Thank you very much. Do you need a book? I, I, let me just uh, thank you very much, uh, Sister uh, Lana, and also all of uh, our uh, brothers who are with us you know, here in the podium, the chair of the OIC, and the chair of the committee, the ministerial committee, Saudi Arabia, uh, the chair of the ministerial committee that emanated from the summit that was, uh, that, that this resolution came from that committee, led by our brothers in Egypt. In fact, you know, I believe that the foreign minister of Egypt was the one who sent that draft to us before the committee came to New York in, in, uh, in, Feb in November. Of course, my brother from Mauritania is the chair of the OIC uh, ministerial committee. Often you see us you know, stand before you, uh, representative of different groups and ambassadors from different groups. Uh, we appreciate that, we thank them. We thank United Arab Emirates, the Arab representative in the Security Council for a remarkable job that she has done and also my brother from Egypt, because Egypt took the lead in the negotiation and in the involvement regarding this draft resolution for obvious reasons uh, related to uh, Egypt and uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, let me repeat from the beginning, we, the Arab group and the OIC, uh, declared that we are working for three humanitarian objectives. One, to stop this war against our people in the Gaza Strip, which means ceasefire, ceasefire, ceasefire now. And then two is to have humanitarian assistance up to scale. And in fact, operative paragraph four, which our brothers in Egypt were pushing so hard for it, they, we trust that the UN to be responsible for the ver verification of thousands of truckloads in order to enter the Gaza Strip at scale that asked for by the SG so that it, 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 uh, it caters to the needs of the Palestinian people in all parts of the Gaza Strip. 
And the third part is related to stopping the uh, you know, forced transfer outside of the Gaza Strip to Egypt. And that's also another uh, very clear concern of Egypt and all of us because we don't want to have a second Nakba and Egypt to be you know, uh, at the receiving end of more than two million Palestine refugees. So these three objectives, we worked for them from the beginning and we are still continuing. We succeeded in going to the General Assembly twice and having resolutions that are more advanced than in the Security Council. And in fact, the last one, we had 153 versus 10 against that resolution. In the Security Council, now we have two resolutions adopted. They are not as ambitious as the ones in the General Assembly, simply because there are those who have a veto power and they can do with it whatever they want. Uh, and uh, often it is being abused. Uh, and in addition to these two resolutions, there are a group of resolutions that, not, that did not succeed because of the veto or the lack of having nine votes. This is where we are. We are continuing the march. We will not relent until we reach an immediate ceasefire and having the massive amount of humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip and to stop the crime against humanity of the, the forced mass transfer outside Gaza. We are getting closer, but we are not there. We will continue going back to the General Assembly, to the Security Council, to the Secretary General, to establish the mechanism to keep demanding that this war has to stop because this is an awful war, criminal war against the Palestinian people. In this connection, as Arabs and OIC who have endorsed you know, the original text of a few days ago in blue that contained, among other things, operative paragraph two, we are happy that the Russian Federation put it to a vote. We voted in favor. It reflects that the majority of nations are in favor of that you know, paragraph, but unfortunately, it was denied because of the veto. So the veto was casted by those who did not allow the original operative paragraph two to be adopted, but yet the resolution was adopted because it has other elements of extreme importance to all of us, especially Egypt with regard to the mechanism and working with the SG, and we will continue working in that direction until we reach our three objectives. We get closer and closer to each and every one of them, and we are grateful to all of our brothers and sisters from the Arab nations, from the OIC, and from others who are outside these groups who stood with us all the way through, who reached the 153 uh, countries uh, adopting the resolution in the General Assembly, and the 104 that within a span of 24 hours uh, co-sponsored that draft resolution in the General Assembly that led to the adoption of that resolution. We thank you very much. One question. In the resolution, it also talks about a unifying of West Bank and Gaza under the Palestinian Authority. Can you explain how that will work in a post-conflict situation? The, all the parts of the state of Palestine is the business of the Palestinian people and their leadership. These are the things that we will uh, deal with when the moment uh, arrives of how we can deal with the new reality after the end of the war. But we never left uh, our people in the Gaza Strip. We are intertwined, we are so connected, we are one. The Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, and everywhere there are Palestinians, we are one. We will never be separated. We will never be divided. The, how to run our affairs and how to govern ourselves, this is the business of the Palestinian people. The resolutions in the uh, Security Council and the General Assembly reaffirm that, whether in the form of the State of Palestine and that the Gaza Strip is a key component of the State of Palestine, or whether in the form of the governance 
of uh, our affairs, which is through the Palestine National Authority, which is running and functioning uh, uh, as much as possible in the Gaza Strip. Now there is war and uh, you know, in the remaining parts of the occupied territory. Those who went and visited Rafah, including uh, you know, uh, uh, Ambassador Lana Nusebe met uh, with, the, uh, with the Red Crescent, who are a key organization of the Palestine National Authority, and it is functioning inside the Gaza Strip, and they briefed them. They met with the Minister of uh, Health Affairs of the State of Palestine, and they run the hospitals. They deal with all of the components of the health uh, situation in the Gaza Strip. She briefed them. And they met also with the Minister of uh, uh, Social Affairs or Social Welfare, in which there are more than 100,000 people inside the Gaza Strip are part of the work and the affairs of this ministry of the Palestine National Authority of the State of Palestine. We uh, do everything that we can to help our people everywhere, particularly those in the Gaza Strip. We are one, we will not be divided, and the governance is a question and it is the issue for the Palestinian people to deal with. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll, just add, I'll just add a few words, you see, without running the risk of repeating what Dr. Yad has said and, and my dear sister, Ambassador Lana. First, just to, to express deep appreciation for the uh, Ambassador Lana and her, her very able team in, in the mission of the UAE. Has, they have done a great job throughout their, uh, their membership in the council, uh, culminated by a, a very important resolution that was adopted today. I wish to say that the, the resolution is, is in itself not an end. It's, it's, it's a tool, effective tool. One of the very uh, important gains out of that uh, draft resolution is that issue, I believe Dr. Yad has referred to it, uh, the establishment of, uh, of uh, a UN mechanism for delivery of uh, humanitarian assistance up to scale, uh, an elevated and enhanced mechanism to work and operate in Gaza, led by a humanitarian coordinator. This is uh, a very important uh, output. This is creating the space that the, the Riyadh Summit has mandated us to, to do our ministers' directives and our leaders' directives to us were crystal clear, and we uh, hear all the drafters, all, all members of the Arab and Muslim uh, group that has contributed to that, uh, believe this, this will uh, effectively help all of us having a better uh, flow of humanitarian assistance into Gaza. We're familiar with the, the humanitarian catastrophe developing in southern Gaza and the challenges there, and, and the resolution is, is a very giant step into the right direction. The, our job now is to focus on the implementation, operationalization of that mechanism, talking to the UN officials and so on, and I, I, I know that Ambassador Lana started even doing that before, and, and Dr. Riyad Mansour, we have been in meeting with different circles of the Secretariat, with the SG himself, will continue doing that. Uh, this is how we see our job and as our duty as members of the Arab group. I've, I have had a wonderful uh, honor of chairing the Arab group in, in December, and that was the collective wisdom coming with it from the Arab and, Is and Islamic group in, in New York. Uh, happy to see uh, uh, the Council moving into the right direction. And the issue of the, the ceasefire, as Dr. Riyad has said, we, we're still coming back and back, and inshallah, till, till we manage to have full cessation of hostilities without any conditionality to save the lives. Saving civilians, saving the lives is the real goal, and, and it merits each and every effort for all of us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, any candidates in mind for the coordinator? That's the choice of the Secretary General. Don't you want to go home for the holidays? <laughs> Happy holidays. <laughs>